Bolton, and uh, the directors of this program um, from the Religious Studies program here at uh, Utah Valley University have asked me to do the introduction of Professor Ignacio Garcia. Um, first of all, I just want to thank the people like Brian Birch and Boyd Peterson who have put together this uh, wonderful conference. I've been able to attend many of the sessions since uh, Wednesday evening, and I have to say that I'm, uh, I, I can't stop thinking about this stuff. And darn it, it makes it really hard to sleep about night, at night when your mind is just racing on these topics. <laughs> but this has been some of the most profound conversation I can think of in my lifetime of, I think, some of the most important issues that confront us Latter-day Saints. And, you know, of course, the most profound issue is probably just simply that of working out our own salvation. But part of that is how we live with each other as fellow saints. And it's at that moment that I think things that have been said, like Gina Colvin's lecture um, or the lecture of uh, Paul Reeve today, um, Darren Smith yesterday, today, yesterday as well, and every other panelist have been fundamental. And I imagine these are the kind of things that are inscribed in the heavens as witnesses and requirements for us as Latter-day Saints to think and move forward. And as a result of that, I'm, I'm really honored to present to you Professor Garcia. I've never had the privilege of meeting Ignacio Garcia until Wednesday, actually. But yet I've known him for many years now because of his work and because of his reputation in the broader La Latter-day Saint community. Professor Gar Garcia is highly respected. And you know, it's interesting, he's managed to uh, carve out a wonderful career at Brigham Young University doing actually fairly radical things while also doing a one, being a wonderful voice of, of uh, commitment and uh, service within the LDS community. Professor Garcia has been a bishop. In fact, he was a bishop already when he was in graduate school in the University of Arizona if I remember what I read. And uh, he has written, I think his last book, he's written so many books, it's hard to keep track of this. In fact, you need to update your stuff online. <laughs> but anyway, Professor Gatt, when his last book, if I recall right, is an autobiography. You know, historians normally write fairly dry books about fairly dry subjects. Um, Professor Garcia is not one of those. His autobiography, contains one of the most compelling personal narratives that I have ever read of life as a child and adolescent, a teenager, in San Antonio, San Antonio, Texas, which is really one of the most complex cities in the United States. It's a fundamentally Mexican city, Mexican-American city, that's almost under military occupation. And yet it is part of the United States. At the same time, it has a very strong Mexican community. And it's playing those worlds back and forth and the world also of the LDS Church as that faith came into Professor Garcia's life that I think makes it one of the most compelling narratives. And then, of course, later on it talks about his life as a soldier and then his life as an academic and his life as a leader in the Latter-day Saint Church. And his autobiography is filled with the dynamism of being a scholar at the same time a faithful and committed Latter-day Saint. I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend his autobiography to you. But then for those of you who are interested, he's also an amazing scholar of Chicanismo. He's written about the growth of the radical movement, the Chicano movement. And that, my friends, is a word that is almost untranslatable. Anglos use the word with abandon, but in the Mexican-American community, it's not so easily accepted. And Chicano is a word that came in a time and place and marked a kind of people and a position within El within. Uh, within American society. He not only talked about the development of this ideology and political movement, he also wrote a book about one of the most important uh, Mexican-American or Chicano parties, the Razonida Party, from Crystal City, Texas, if I remember right, that absolutely shocked much of the Anglo establishment at the time, particularly the Texas establishment, but became a very important voice within the, within the civil rights movement, the Mexican-American rights movement. Professor Garcia has also written about sports, He's written about the war. I think you've even written a novel. And so, you know, he's one of the most amazing literary and historical figures in Mormonism. And yet he's a very gentle man with a quiet voice who shows a commitment to faith, at the same time a commitment to 
very careful and detailed scholarship. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce to you the Lemuel Red Professor of History from Brigham Young University, Professor Ignacio Garcia. I think I should quit now because I don't think I can match that. <laughs> and I appreciate that, David. And I, I followed uh, David myself for, for a number of years, and I'm, I'm so glad that we got a chance to meet. You, you look different from your Facebook picture. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. It, this has been a great conference. I, I went home uh, on Wednesday night and then last night and just told my wife how incredibly uh, reflective uh, the, the presentations have been, how, how it made me uh, sort of stretch my own views of the church, um, and though I have my own sort of critiques, I have been very fascinated by how others in their own communities, in their own cultures, have been able to critique. Um, now, Gina and Moroni did something that sort of challenged me, so I will, I will try to match them. Y ese es de hablar en mi uh, lengua nativa, y decir que el el pueblo latino mormón es uno de los pueblos más grandes durante el, dentro de la iglesia, pero también sutilmente, probablemente uno de los más colonizados dentro de la iglesia, no en términos de sufrimiento, pero en términos de cómo están en este momento. Anyway, I'll quit there. Um, but uh, what I want to do, and, I, and I'll tell you later what, what I said, for those of you who didn't understand, but I, I'm sure. Anybody went to uh, on a Spanish-speaking mission here? Oh, there's a few of you, so, and, and a, a couple others that, that understand Spanish, so, so remind me at the end, see if I can remember what I said. Um, what, I, what I want to do today is a little different from, I think, uh, in some ways, what has been done before, and so hopefully it contributes in a different way in terms of how we uh, talk about... Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you. Um, and, and part of this discussion is really a personal journey. It's a, it's a journey of, of a, a personal experience connected to a little bit of history, a little bit of theology, and a little bit of cultural uh, conversations that Latinos have among themselves. And Latinos, in, in many ways, uh, they are the largest non-white group within the church. They're also, they've also been here, there, within the church, probably as long as anyone consistently. And, and they also, in some ways, uh, the ones that is most adapted to the white church and yet has created the largest resistance. Uh, when you talk about uh, Latinos, Mexican-Americans, you talk about a people who have resisted colonization in many ways, some openly, as, as they did in the Third Convention in Mexico, some uh, as they did at El Paso by speaking out and getting together, and others who do it daily, or at least every Sunday, and resist what in many ways is an institutional colonization. Um, but it's a very personal story. And so let, let me begin uh, with that. And let me begin also with something I think that all of us believe in or feel, but as we become critics, we sort of, sort of push aside for a while. So let me start off with something that I think is very important, loving the white church. And I think those of us, or at least most of us who uh, have become critics, those of us who are people of color who confront these difficulties, always remember a nostalgic period in which the church seemed so real and true to us, right? That it wasn't, it was true. And I think that was so important for us as Latter-day Saints, uh, Latino Latter-day Saints who were converting. We were converting to the truth. And that in itself created certain parameters, certain sort of restrictions within us. If it was true, then everything was true, okay? And as a, as a young person, I was a real orthodox kid. I was the kind of kid who, I didn't fast for 24 hours. I thought that was for sissies. I would fast 36 hours. I would go home teaching every single day of the month, and I couldn't find a senior companion. I found one. I was a, a fellow who went in the morning to church, then stayed through the 
four hours before the next session of church so that I could read and sing and, uh, and invited my, my friends. Some of them sort of couldn't put up with that, but, but at least I could get one for an hour and then another for another hour. And the church was true. What else more did I need than that? And also for, for my community, it, it created, it gave us a form of community. We had a structure, that is a building, we had a kitchen, which is very important for, for people of color. Uh, we had a kitchen. We had a, a, a recreational hall. We taught classes. I, I started teaching in primary at the age of 16. And I was a young man's president at the age of 18. Uh, we led. We ministered. Uh, and as I said, we, we went home teaching. We went missionary with a missionary companions. Uh, this was a whole life of us. And in many ways for Latino Latter-day Saints, this was important because once we became Mormons in a predominantly Catholic community, that really created a lot of problems. And I, I remember going to school and there was two of us. He was Jehovah's Witness and I was Mormon. And the kids, of course, would have a heyday uh, talking about us and, and creating problems for us. And so because of that, we were pushed even further into the church. It became our salvation. It became our sanctuary. It became the place where we could sort of uh, fulfill our measure. And so that was important, and so we, we loved the church. Uh, it showed us, or our leaders showed us love. They made promises to and about us. And that was significant for a little boy who was very poor, who had all kinds of inferiority complexes, who couldn't play sports, but the church provided me an opportunity to play softball. I was a second baseman. Uh, to play basketball. I was a sort of short guard. Uh, to give talks in church. To engage in, in uh, speech festivals. To come out in plays. Uh, I mean, where else would I get that? I wasn't articulate enough to be in the school. Well, I actually... Through the church, I became uh, best actor in the senior play in high school. But that wouldn't have been possible without the church. I mean, none of the things that I did. I became debate champ. Uh, but that's because of the church. Everything that I had at that moment was the church. And so we love the church. And I think a lot of us here can relate to it. And people of color can relate to those moments in which the church was so important. And there seemed to be only one culture. Right? So, Gina, there was, in our, in our mind, one culture, right? uh, the Mormon culture. And, and, of course, because we were running from the Catholic culture, uh, because we were running from the outside world, it seemed so real to us that we had a Mormon culture. Something that was with us or uh, for us and that we could share with so many other people. And there's such a wonderful feeling when I was a kid to hear the church saying, well, we got many more stakes, many more wards, many more missionaries, because that's me. That was part of me, right? Every time there was a new ward, I grew. And those, those were the things that, that made the church so special uh, to me. And I think to a lot of Latinos and a lot of uh, saints of color, when we first come in and confront that situation, it is a wonderful experience. But it wasn't too long before I found out we... We're not quite equal, and surely we weren't white. And white is very important for Mexican Americans and Latinos. I mean, we've been fighting over the issue. And one of the, 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 the worst things that could have been done to, to, to my people is that when the War of 1848 ended, when we had taken half of Mexico's territory, our territory, occupied territories, we, we like to call it sometimes, occupied Aslan. Um, they made us white simply because they allowed us to be citizens. And you could only be a citizen if you were white. So we were white. Now, the courts had a problem with dealing with that. Okay, So it, it wasn't completely that we were white. But by saying we were white, and then by society and some of the courts sort of pushing back against white, white became a real dilemma for us. And it impacted a lot of the things we did. Are you white? Are you not white? What are you? And so white was important to us. 
or at least it was important in our conversations. The kingdom of God did seem equal, though mostly on Sundays and mostly among ourselves. And the few visiting high councilmen who always said that we had such a wonderful spirit. We were so spiritual. We were so humble. We were so different. I, I'm not sure, Gina, if, if you guys get that, but I'm sure you do, right? And Jana, that you probably maybe do that. I don't know. But we, we, we sort of get that, right? We, we are. And so and during that moment, we were equal because we were in somehow humble and good and committed. Uh, but soon we started to find out that we were equal, mostly in our buildings and our meeting places, but not in theirs. So when we went to state conference, we didn't feel as comfortable. And we saw where we sat and where the rest of the people sat. And we saw how many strategies there were to provide translation for us. I remember there was in one ward that I was in uh, where this wonderful old guy said, you know what, I can build this room with this sort of glass window, and then you can hear the gospel within your own space. How do you like that? Uh, well, I don't think we'd like that. And so we sort of rejected that. Uh, but so we went to youth conferences, right? And, and we were going to be all there together. And always in the sort of opening exercises, it was just this feeling we're all together until we picked teams, until we sort of found our little spaces in the recreational hall. And all of a sudden, we were here, and everybody else was there. And trying to relate to other people uh, was very difficult. And I remember, the, you know, for a young male, to find these incredibly beautiful, and I hope that's not offensive to our, uh, to our feminist. Uh, it was a beautiful girl. <laughs> she was extremely beautiful and extremely intelligent, and she was everything else. And I remember in a meeting that we had, one of these youth meetings, planning an activity, I looked at her, and she looked at me, and it was like, there's probably something there, right? And that night, we had a dance. And so I saw her, and I said, I'm going to try and see. I'm going to really just go out and see if she really meant it. And I think that she did, right? So we went to dance. We tried to dance. And she had that she was just wonderful trained repertoire. And I was trying to dance like you do on the west side of San Antonio. And before you know it, we're going in circles. Just like that. And it seemed like everybody was just moving back and looking at us. And it became embarrassing. And we tried everything. And I, I, you know, she tried everything. I tried everything. At the end of the dance, you know, we looked at each other. And she walked that way. I walked this way. And there was this group. And, I, and I'm not sure what her reception was within her group, because she was one of the girls in, in the stake. But I know that the Latinas just smirked and laughed and thought, this guy thought he could get away. He's not. And the guy said, pobrecito. Right? <laughs> and that ended the last time I ever saw to date a, a, a young white sister. Um, but it really it was interesting. It was just a simple cultural thing. But it, it reinforced that we couldn't even dance together. We couldn't even dance, right? Um, and then you, you get to realize that on the outside, we all conform to the pecking order. I mean, it was no different uh, for us as Latter-day Saints, with them as Latter-day Saints, if we saw ourselves out in the pecking order. Maybe in, in a sort of isolated moment, somebody said, hermano, you know, brother. And then when we sort of dealt with the usual, it was them, and it was us. And they lived over there, and we lived over here. And we soon became frustrated. I remember the first time I really got frustrated with a relationship. There was an election uh, in the city of San Antonio, very divided city. And uh, there was this activist, Latino activist, who wasn't Mormon, but he just represented everything we wanted to hear. He wanted to fix our streets. He wanted to make sure that police and the, and the uh, 
uh, and the fire department would respond to us. He wanted to end police brutality. There's so many things he want. He wanted to do, and so we were excited. Everybody, Mormon, Catholic, whatever, was excited for this Pete Torres, this short little guy who was going to run for city council. And because in San Antonio it was at large, they just picked and placed you wherever, and they placed him, lo and behold, in the spot that our state president held. So here he was. Oh, my God. He's running against President Bramer. Yeah, but it's Pete Torres. Yeah, but he's running against the president. Yeah, but he's Pete Torres. And it was a very interesting thing. And so being one of those really faithful Mormons, I looked at the sort of campaign literature. What is President Bramer promising? I know he's got to be promising something good for me because he is that incredible man who comes periodically, he says hi to us, he really loves it. Now, we, we've had stake president before, and they didn't love us. But President Bramer, he loved us. Um, but it was about good government, efficient government, government uh, uh, friendly to business. That's all it was, yeah. It's the typical uh, sort of Anglo politician in San Antonio uh, spill. And here Pete Torres was talking about everything we wanted done in our side of town. And so after the election, my companion, he was the, 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 my senior companion in home teaching, we were walking down the hallway of the stake. I don't know why we were in the stake offices. And President Bramer came up and he said, did you vote? Yes, my friend. And my friend sort of stood for a second. He said, no, I, I forgot to vote. And so the president just shook his head and walked away. And he turned to me and he said, how could I tell him that I had voted for the other guy? Wow, it's our first political sort of, our, our first political battle, and I had not been loyal to those who were my leaders in church. Then there was another event. It was actually come shortly after that. I went with my, uh, my uh, priest advisor to go buy some books, and at, back at that time, there was no desert books, at least not outside the, uh, uh, Utah, and so we buy our books from the high priest group leader or the stake president who was really the, the uh, leader of the, of the high priest. And so we went there and we were looking at some books and the, uh, the, the stake president's wife came up to us, very nice lady, very tall, very nice lady. And while we were looking for books, another gentleman came in and they started talking about an issue, uh, that something that occurred there just a couple of days before. And it was this young kid, Latino kid, 12 years old, but he looked more like he was eight or nine, had gone into the north side of town got into a house, wasn't a very good thief, so they, the, uh, the family called the police. The police came, he ran, he's scared. He always ran, when I was growing up, from white people, because they were authority, they were always, you always ended up having a problem, so he ran, and the policeman shot him six times in the back. Uh, and of course, you can imagine what the Latino community was thinking, and we were just angry, we were just, uh, it was revolting to know that. And as the, they got into a conversation, the, the, the man said to him, did you hear about that? You know, and this and that. And she said, yes. And then so they both agreed that it was the right thing to do. The policeman should have shot that because he had, you know, he entered private property. Now here's this naive Latino Mormon who believes that all Mormons sort of understand and get it, right? We're compassionate. Or against violence, we would just see that as something horrendous. And then I started hearing them saying, yeah, that's the right thing to do. And so I looked at them and I said, aren't you Mormons? I was asking the stake president's wife if she was a Mormon. And, and they looked at me and I said, Mormons don't do that. We don't do that. We don't believe that. Um, and he was only a little kid. And so she looks at me, my tall lady, just straight at me on my eyes. And she said, if he had entered my house, I would have shot him with my own gun. Okay. This wasn't only something revolting that all of us might find problematic, but everything in San Antonio was racialized. Everything. Everything we said was racialized. So shooting, this kid wasn't shooting a thief, it was shooting a little Mexican kid who had crossed boundaries and entered 
an arena that was preserved for someone else, not for us. So how did this uh, disappoint me? Well, my, the person who had taken me was my, you know, my priest uh, advisor, an incredible man, someone who would be our bishop later on and, and who would be our patriarch. And I looked at him, and he grabbed me and he dragged me out. And we went home, and he didn't say a word, not a single word. And I was, I was a young boy needing some kind of explanation, some kind of counsel, something, some scripture, you know, whatever. And he didn't say a word. And we went home. And I began to notice how the relationship impacted. Here was this woman who had intimidated him. Could have been a man, but she was just a very strong woman who intimidated him. And he was only intimidated because she was tall and she was the uh, stake president's wife, but she, he was intimidated because she represented everything that was the authority that was larger than us. She represented those who defined the gospel for us, who made the rules, who created the rules, who maintained the rules. And here was the man that I thought, if he's capable, war veteran, Korean War veteran, you can't be afraid of anybody, uh, very spiritual, had a wonderful way of teaching us, and yet he couldn't say anything. Does that sound familiar to people of color? Have we confronted that situation? And then I, and then I started hearing about Ephraim and Manasseh and all of these other things that indicated we were all one day be equal but we weren't equal then. And all of a sudden, I realized that this difference, this, this sort of uh, conflict between us and them extended not only to the church, but to heaven. The pecking order was going to go to heaven. And a strange feeling, isn't it? When all of a sudden, you realize that even in heaven, there's a structure there. Now, you know, that's not church doctrine per se, but it became theological and it became very much a part of the discussions we had. And so Latinos, as other people of color, have always confronted that fact that we are not truly equal in the kingdom of God. And that, for someone who loved the church, someone who was very orthodox, was a very difficult thing to say. See, I, I wasn't the cynical kid. I think if I'd been cynical, then it would have saved me a lot of heartaches. But I wasn't, as many of you are not. You know, you just, well, maybe we are. If you're in this room, we probably are a little, <laughs> a little cynical. But, but most of us sort of grew up in a stage when we weren't cynical. And so all of that became so problematic, OK? And then I started listening to what we were saying, OK? How were we dealing with that? How was the rank and file and the leaders and all of you? How were we dealing with this sort of difference? And well, I have this story from a friend of mine who has a Peruvian friend. A Peruvian friend says he really wants this life to, you know, to be over. Just get it over with. Because I want the resurrection. I want it now. Why do you want the resurrection? Well, because I'm going to be tall, blonde, blue-eyed when I resurrect. And we're talking about a fellow who had been a leader in Peru. He, was, he wasn't just somebody who was ignorant completely. He just said, but I want that, because that's the promise. <coughs> OK, all right, all right. I wouldn't mind being a little bit taller, but I'm not sure that I <laughs> need to be blonde or blue eye. Then one day, I was at the, um, at the Timpanogos Temple. And we were waiting for a couple to be sealed. And as we were sitting down, I was next to uh, my ward bishop, and this beautiful couple uh, went by. He was white and she was Latina. And he leaned over to me and he said, have you ever noticed that when a white guy marries a Latina on the outside, the kids turn out brown? But when that same combination occurs in the church, they come out whiter? No. I don't know how to respond. I'm in the temple. How do I, you know, do I throw a fit? Do I, and he's my bishop, right? And uh, 
wonderful man. Many, very progressive in many ways, very committed to his people, committed to the undocumented, you know, just totally committed to his people. But that was his comment. Then I go outside the temple. So I'm, I'm still shaking from that, okay? I'm still trying to deal with that, trying to find a, a nice answer once I see him again, I don't see him again. And then a friend of mine comes over to me. Dear, committed, progressive, you know, la manitas, rah, rah. And he says to me, you know, we're not ready for prime time, either in the church or outside. I guess the prophecy of blossoming hasn't come through yet. I wonder when it will be. And so here I am. I, I, I even forgot about the married couple. But what could I tell him? It was the temple grounds again. I mean, I, I don't know if that I could, you know, rant and rave. But more than anything else, it just felt so sad that those who I admired and loved were struggling with that. I weren't teaching a false doctrine. They were just simply repeating something that they had heard and had been ingrained in their minds that even though they could become very progressive in things, they would still see color. They would still think about the pecking order. They would still talk about prophecy coming one day. Uh, my wife and I had a conversation. And as most of you who study Latinos know, Latinos fall into this whole dichotomy of, of, of whiteness. I think African Americans, maybe, maybe Polynesians do too, where if the child is a lot whiter, that's nice. If they're a little darker, that's OK. There are kids anyway. Uh, but it's very much, and so we said, you know, let's never get caught up. We don't do it, but let's just make sure we never get caught up. And, it, and it's funny for a fellow my age to try to be reaffirming that because of what is out there. And of course, the Book of Mormon. When, when I first started, the Book of Mormon was, there was there's nothing wrong with the Book of Mormon. I mean, there were some evil people who got turned darker or whatever, but you know, nobody cared. Until you, you start reading it again, and it comes up. And, and then I realized that that's more, said more often than I thought. At first, I thought it was once. Maybe somebody said it once, maybe <laughs> twice. And all of a sudden, boom, 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 it's everywhere. And I, I, and I just take it, you know, you know, and I'm not getting theological here. But whatever it is, once you are sensitive to what color and what pecking order is in the church, you become very sensitive. If you're poor, you become very sensitive to the story of the poor in the, in, in the Book of Mormon. And if you're of color, whatever the color, you become extremely sensitive on the issues of color. But always, of course, the solution is we will get whiter one day. Whether we marry somebody or whatever, or we eat better food, Mormon food, whatever, we're going to get white, <laughs> right? And for many, it's... We don't talk about it in a way of saying, yeah, it's there, because you don't do it in polite conversation. But, you know, that's, that's sort of your trump card, right? At the end, whatever happens, you know, be a little bit quieter. Um, the question we haven't been able to resolve. Oh, we resolve it here. Of course. Who wouldn't? It would take somebody really dumb person not to. But we haven't resolved it here completely. Because our theology, you know, I was talking to someone who said, you know, when the brethren receive a revelation, they receive it, resolve it in their mind, and they put it in a box and close it. And so there's no theology of what it means to eliminate the priesthood ban. There is no theology on what, how we do away with what we used to think in terms of color. If it wasn't for Paul Reed, we wouldn't even have an essay on the priesthood and the race, and race, right? We don't do good theology. We don't know how to, how, to, how to sort of correct things. So we just get it in our own mind. Of course you know, and as President Packer used to love to say, of course we know that, right? And if you, so if you bring it up to, to someone, you'll say, of course we know that. Everybody is equal in the eyes of God, right? Uh, and it's true. We do believe that. But it's hard to forget that which we've been taught for so long. And it impacts the way we are. 
because if we're not white or something, what's, what happens in heaven? And I had the whole spill on this aspect. That's why I, I named it Mormon Afterlife, but I decided to cut it out because it was sort of a little bit rough. Um, but, but I do ask people, when they think of heaven, what kind of people do they think of? I don't mean your word going to heaven. I mean, when you think of heaven, when you think of the, the great and noble ones in the pre-existence, what do you think of? And if you can't think of your own, there's an impact on how you see even the heavens. The heavens become a pecking order. And if we are to be here and take everything we do here over there, but people of color never found the Book of Mormon, never translated scripture, never created temples, never created or, or, or sort of brought the priesthood out. I mean, I mean, gosh, if... I, and I, when people say, I want the second coming to come now, I say, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Because then where does that leave me and my people? Silly? Yes. But can you imagine? Can you imagine a structure in the afterlife that isn't very similar to what it is? Now, we all say we do. And if we're here, we should. But can we even contemplate what that means? Will those who are on top be on top forever? Sure seems like it. Because there doesn't seem to be any theology that says, you know, we all know it's wrong, but let me tell you why it's wrong, and let me tell you what the real thing is. We don't have any of that, right? We don't have any of that. Okay. But then everybody said, well, the blossoming, the blossoming, right? We're, we're going to blossom one day. Right, and we all love to, uh, to quote that scripture in Jacob. What does anybody remember? Not Jacob, the one about we're going to tear them like lions, tear them. Uh, you don't remember that scripture? I always forget it. And I always think about it. But, you know, one day we're going to be there. We're going to be like lions just roaring through all these, these people that don't care about us and, you know, whatever. But, you know, the lion never comes. We're still cubs. Uh, and sometimes we think that our future, is our future now or is it past? I mean, all these blossoming stuff has gone out of favor in, in the church. Nobody talks about that anymore. Have you noticed that? Nobody talks about that. So, so does that mean the future is now the past? Is the golden era for Latinos die with Spencer W. Kimball? Or was it ever an, a golden age and maybe not just the bronze age? in which there were a lot of promises. And if you notice that, and you know, and again, President Kimball is our prophet, okay? He's not your prophet, he's our prophet. He's Latinos, people of, of colors, prophet. At least that's the way I grew up, believing. Uh, but, but his mindset, you know, was part of the way the mindset of many good white members were. You know, he wanted to see us in terms of being so much like the rest of them. And as we've heard from Gina and Moroni and others, you know, culture is so fundamental to who we are. God made us that way, okay? We didn't pick our race, our color, or our culture. I mean, we can get away from it, but we, we grew up in a culture. And so I thought about uh, how he perceived us, and then I thought, Okay, he wants us successful. He wants us integrated. But it is about reading, as he once told a Native American individual. And by the way, I love President Kimball, so it, it pains me to even say anything like this. <laughs> but he said, you, you need to read the newspaper, watch TV, read books about people who have succeeded. Well, you know, not even succeeded if you were in the reservation or in the barrio or in the ghetto is white people. We don't have examples in the church. We're going to change that. We're changing that, but we don't have examples of others. You know, concerning, and I have an issue with everyone in the church, okay? You, you'll find that I'm, I'm nice talking, but I, or I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I talk nicely, but I, I have a lot of issues. <laughs> Conservatives in the church say that we're the lamanitas, but our blossoming is far, 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 far away. Okay, it'll come, but like 
Someday. Now, I don't want to offend the rest of you. Liberals say la manita and lemonite is offensive. But then they offer only the salad bowl where the lettuce dominates. Who's the lettuce? <laughs> right? So there's not a good option. We're a melting pot or we're a salad bowl, but either both, you know, we're either the little tomato or the slice of onion or whatever. And, the, and we're still drowning in a bowl of lettuce. <coughs> I like to think of the church as a vegetable garden where every plant has their little sp space where their roots can go down. They are all different, and so some you trim, some you water a little bit more, some you water a little bit less, some you need certain pesticide, others by nature can you know, sort of reject insects, and you can see it. And, it, and when, 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 uh, if, if you've had a vegetable garden, it's beautiful. And nothing loses itself. They're all there. Anyway, but that's just another theory, and I'm sure somebody will be here a few years and sort of debunk that theory too. But <laughs> that's how I see that, you know. And so I take issue with liberals and conservatives in the church because they don't understand this, right? And, and not that they should completely understand. It would be silly to, to expect that they understand us fully, only that, I, and I say this only simply because um, we are often pulled, because we are an ahistorical people, we are pulled to some historical explanation. Okay? So, we have to go one way or the other. Uh, and in some ways, both offer more of the same. No significance of Latinos, or may say people of color, theologically. We play no role, right? We play no role whatsoever, okay? History. Why didn't the pioneers take us, take us with them? Okay. If they had, if we'd had a company of Mexicans or Latinos in the pioneer trail, we would have been remembered, okay? I have a friend who said, yeah, there was a Mexican with Brigham Young. I've never been able to find him. Paul, have you ever found a Mexican in Brigham Young's uh, company? But it's, so it's one of those myths. Yeah, of course we were there. We're everywhere. Mexicans are everywhere. <laughs> you know, everywhere. Yeah, everywhere you go, there's a Mexican. So of course there had to be. Well, in the beginning was the word, and Joseph, and Brigham, and pioneers, and missionaries, and polygamy, temples, priesthood, prophets. But there's no Mexicans, or Latinos or Peruvians, Argentinos, Hondureños, Salvadoreños, on and on. Where were we in the early years? I mean, we had proselyting missions there. Ray L. Pratt talked about us as if we were the only people in the world. But where are we in the history? Okay. Where were we? And again, I said, Brigham, with Brigham and the pioneers. That's where we were. Where were we in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 80s, the 90s? in church history. Anybody know? Taking a siesta? <laughs> Looking out for whatever? Standing on the street corner, waiting for somebody to pick us up to go do some work? Where were we? In the church. In what wing of the, his of the church history building can we be found? Anybody know? Is there? Because I don't know. I haven't gone to the new one, so. But it, the old one didn't have it. So, so we're not there, right? Okay. Okay, no problem. So where are we in church history? And it seems like at this moment, we're nowhere. Right? Okay. Okay. Um, and that's significant, because that means we become an ahistorical people. And Octavio Romano, one of the great Chicano intellectuals of the 1960s, says, we are not ahistorical, talking about Mexicans, because we didn't engage in history. We're ahistorical because those who write history have not written us into history. And so people of color are ahistorical. Surely Latinos are ahistorical. 
But you know, there were people. And, and I, after I wrote this, I, I felt bad because I should have put Las Hermanas Rivera and Las Hermanas Hernandez. But then being a, a male, I ended up picking the two easiest ones and the ones where the documentation is there. So Eduardo and Orlando. But, but they were good guys. You know, the, the story of the Latino, the Mexican saint, is a very complicated story of faith, perseverance, and silence. We have done so much of our work, but we are silent, even among ourselves, even to each other sometimes. Unless we get past the first couple of layers, we are very silent. You know, Eduardo Valderas uh, grew up in El Paso, Texas, uh, and he came to Utah to spread the gospel, but in a very different way. He came as the first church translator. In fact, he developed the church translation department. Now, he never became head of it. He never got credit for it. But without him, there would not have been a church translation department. Now, I know people take issue with that, but, but that is the reality. He was the first one, first professional translator in the church, who recruited others and who, who started saying, look, you know, we, we need more than Spanish. We need someone, we need other languages. And he was the first one. And in fact, and as a translator, he'd go to other places. He had to go, to, you know, follow the brethren in, in Spanish-speaking countries and then uh, translate while they spoke, which is a horrendously difficult thing to do. He was a translator. He was also a patriarch. And he, he became a patriarch. And then the church would send him to Spain, to Latin America, to Mesa, Arizona, to Puerto Rico to give patriarchal blessings. He was, to Latinos, our general authority, okay? And I still find people who got a patriarchal blessing from him. But he had no public voice. And I remember reading in this big conference in which, and I won't mention who, who the, the, the presiding authority was, who knew a little bit of Spanish. And, and this whole tr conference had been translated in the paperwork and everything else. And, and the gentleman said, uh, I'm so proud to have translated the conference with a little bit of help from Eduardo. And of course, if, you, if, if, if you're a person of color, and you, you, you read the documents, you have to interpret them differently, right? Who's the guy who knows Spanish? Who's the guy doing the translation? Who gets credit? Who doesn't get credit? Anyway. Uh, oh, by the way, he was in his branch for nearly 50 years. And he served as a counselor in a branch presidency that for 50 years had a young, white, branch president, and then bishop. And one of the stories is this fellow, and, and, and you sort of felt sorry for him. He had just come back from his mission from somewhere in Mexico. He was 22 years old, and he was called to be the branch president of the Lemanite, La, La Manita branch. And here you had Valderas, and you had a number of other incredible people, but he never got to serve. And this whole generation of really incredible people that we'll be talking about never got a chance to be the presiding officers in their branch or ward. But here comes Orlando Rivera, the first Mormon bishop in Utah. I'm, I'm sorry, first Spanish-speaking Latino bishop in Utah. I'm running out of time, I know. I'm, I'm getting the eye there. But he was also very much a social activist. And he was one of the first ones to publicly, see, Eduardo never did it, but Orlando did. He challenged the church. He said, hey, there's a problem here. And if you do not relate to people, you're going to lose them. You may convert them, but you're going to lose them because you don't relate to them. So what they do, they, they move from the Southwest, emphasizing to go to Latin America because you get a bigger bang for the buck, more converts. And these Latinos in the US, God, they're problematic. They got all of these issues, and, but these people down there, they don't. They don't have these issues. And of course, all the sisters that made it possible. Without the Rivera sisters, there'd be no uh, Lemonite branch. Without the Hernandez sisters, there wouldn't be any growth in the church. The Bautista sisters, the Torres, and many others, who unfortunately, we have so much little information on them. But I'll, I'll tell you what, for, for those of you who really see the empowerment of women as important, of women, I think it was 1928. The young man's, the, the youth program in La Rama Latina. Presidents of the, of, the, of the young man, or the youth program, was a sister. First counselor was a man. A couple of years later, it was a man who was the president of the youth 
But it was a, a woman who was the first counselor. God, that, that seems so refreshing when I, when I read that, right? That these women were making decisions beyond uh, others. And of course, so many other unsung heroes. And as we would say in the barrio, hombre, mujer, necesitamos nuestra historia. We need our stories. We need our history. Without it, and so uh, let me finish fast and, because I don't have much time. We need to create a new paradigm. And then Matthew told me, we probably shouldn't have a paradigm. And I said, you're probably right, because it's too big. But at least we should, as Gina sort of told us, we should at least ask the questions and think about the possibilities, even if we're not fully ready for it. But we ought to think about them. And so I say, we need the new paradigm. And, but we need to place our history outside the new and the old Mormon narrative, OK? We need to get out. When the Chicano movement began, the first thing that Chicano intellectuals said is, we've got to reject what they used to call the liberal agenda. It wasn't about liberals, but you, you understand we are a liberal cap uh, capitalism. And he said, we have to reject it because there's no way to be integrated into it. Any time we try to integrate, we're always the sidebar, the footnote, the little quaint story. So you can't integrate it in, in, in that sense into the larger Mormon narrative. And so we need to place ourselves outside of that history. The old marginalizes us. You know, we're not there completely. We're not there. And if we are, we have some problem needed to be fixed. And here, I'm going to get in trouble with some of you. but. And the new has us always been acted upon. Not true. We're acted upon. We're not, we're not actors in our history. We are just acted upon. We need to decentralize the spiritual. It's OK, even if we don't say it, to say, my God is bigger than your God. That's not the right Mormon way, but you have to believe that your God is big. That's why brown is beautiful, black is beautiful, black lives matter. It isn't because they matter more. It's because no one is saying it in the right way. So you have to say it. So it's OK to say, my God is bigger than your God. We know that's not true, but we need to create Latino and colored spaces, places where we grew, where we develop, where we are part of something bigger. And it has to be a place where we do not feel inadequate. We do not feel like we're less than. We don't feel the intruded on. We need to identify our heroes, our miracles, our religious culture. One time I was teaching Sunday school and I said, OK, tell me about miracles. And so people were talking about, oh, you know, I, I had you know, one arm, and then I had two arms, or you know, I had cancer, I was dying, and I didn't have cancer, and I wasn't dying. But this little old lady waved her hand back, and I said, I said, yes. And she said, well, let me tell you the story. I was coming up from Mexico toward El Paso. And immediately I thought, uh-oh, we're going to talk about a non-documented story here. And so she said, we're going in this line of cars, and then we stop, and then we notice there's a border checkpoint. And we get closer and closer. And as we get closer, we're praying. We're praying because we're coming to Zion. OK? We're coming for something good. And he said, and so the last car leaves, and we're about to be waved in when all of a sudden this incredible wind and hailstorm comes. I mean, it just pours down. And of course, he doesn't want to get wet, so he just says. <laughs> and so he passed. And he says, one block away, it's clear, it's <laughs> sunny, it's beautiful. And she said, you know what? My three kids went on a mission. They're married in the temple. Once a bishop, they're building the kingdom of God. Thank God for that miracle. Oh, boy. As the congregation was sitting, the, the younger arrival was saying, yeah. The others were like, yeah. And then, of course, there were the others who said, how can you say that? We need to accept our miracles. We need to create our miracles. We need our religious culture. And we could talk for hours on what that means. And we need to write for ourselves, recover the voices even if the words are lost. We have to recover them. I told that to the Mormon History Association a few years, three years ago. We need to create Mormon historians of color, Latinos. 
And then one of my research assistants, Joseph, I don't think he's here, who said, I go to the MHA and there's probably one black woman, graduate student. There are no Latinos, there are no Polynesians, there are no whatever. We need those. We need to help create a paradigm of religious and spiritual multiculturalism, but it's only going to be in that vegetable garden in which we all have a profound sense of who we are. And, that, and, and, and the, the thing about this that I, that I want to emphasize is that the story of the people and saints of color is a story of faith. It's a story of fidelity. It's a story of wanting to build the kingdom of God. So, so investing in us is not about ripping the kingdom apart, but in fact, it's about strengthening the kingdom of God. By the way, I, I'm grateful again, and what I said basically was, I'm grateful to be here. Um, and I forgot the rest of what I said, so anyway, thank you. Thank you.